Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton. So I'm sure you, like me, are very excited about Elden Ring. I cannot wait to get my hands on it, but a major part of the joy in a FromSoft game for me is the joy of discovery and exploration. Even getting blindsided by some kind of existentially corrupted goblin man provokes a sense of spiky glee in me. I love to see what nasty tricks they've thought up this time. Because of that, I've been trying very hard to avoid all information about this game before it comes out, but the one thing I have exposed myself to is this initial gameplay reveal. In the time since I started working on this video and it being released, there has of course been the network test, which means that there are a lot of gameplay videos showing off a lot more of the game now, but I'm avoiding those, so I thought I'd like to share what insights I have based on this reveal alone. The narrator calls the setting The Land Between, which is fitting, from soft love to set their games in liminal spaces between reality and dreams, but he also calls this specific place a site of grace. This game's equivalent to a bonfire, this is presumably a reference to the concept of divine grace. Also, note the studiously ignored NPC in the background. Curiously, it seems to pop out of the ground, almost like roots, which presumably is related to the giant trees that are visible in almost every part of the game, as far as I can see. Oh look, normal non-hostile wildlife. I wonder if the giant ghostly trees mark important locations, or if they're just a background feature of this particular zone. I love the designs of these caravans, both the baroque coaches themselves and the impaled giants dragging it. Really interesting visuals. Blink and you'll miss it, but there's an eggy looking thing on the right hand side here as the rider enters this area. By the way, I'm unmuting the audio only when the narrator isn't speaking. It's nice to see that they're still using the same sound effect to let you know something somewhere has died. The FromSoft shank of doom is going to outlive all of us. The egg is presumably connected to the dragon immediately swooping down and attacking, but I wonder if that means there's scripted events like this spread throughout the world and they're all unique, or if there is a there is a systemic element included. Mounted combat's clearly going to be an important part of the game, but I wonder how developed it'll be. I have a sneaking suspicion that weapons will just have one or two alternate mounted attacks rather than having entirely separate movesets. That said, it's a welcome addition to the Dark Souls monster hunter giant monster battles. FromSoft's combat's always at the best when it's you versus a mighty swordsman, but I do have an affection for the giant monster battles. Also, a riposte indicator is a nice addition, but I wonder whether that's actually a marker of something that's happening dynamically within the combat, or if it's just a Hey, you've won. Time to play the finisher animation. Hopefully the former, not the latter. Can you hear me? Help me. I'm stuck. Hello? Please, anyone? Alexander Potguy is clearly being set up to be this game's Siegmeier because FromSoft do oh, love their recurring my roles. Stars. I'm so happy to see you. I am Alexander, also known as the Iron Fist. And as you can see, I'm stuck here. Please. Can you help me out of this? But I think he's got a really interesting visual design. Put those doubts to rest. I'll be just fine. I'm very well trained. Give it your all, I say. The wax seal is evocative all by itself, and that tree motif is recurring throughout the areas they show. Is he an imprisoned person? Is this a spirit jar? Is he some kind of construct? Note the rubble tar arms. I wonder if that's the material contained within. I hope I get the chance to crack one open at some point and find out. Ah, well played, good sir. Well played. Though that mighty wallop of yours almost spelt the end of me. <laughs> ah. I really like this Middle Eastern inspired armor set. It's very Arabian Nights. I hope it's a sign that they're pulling inspiration a bit more widely this time around. From Software have always had really interesting and innovative visual designs, but they have also always been squarely based in medieval European fantasy. This map is absolutely lovely. I'm a real sucker for a beautifully illustrated map, and I've put several on my walls over the years. The way this one references historical map making styles is just kind of delightful. Also, jumping back for a second, the visuals of this area are gorgeous, but I wonder how FromSoft are going to adapt to the challenge of a genuinely open world. Their previous games have usually been very, very tightly designed spaces that feel like an open world but are actually quite linear, just heavily layered and coiled around one another. Incidentally, the narrator mentions that you can put markers on the map and they'll be represented in the physical world. It's always really funny to me when at one of these big industry presentations, the company just announces that they've innovated by including this feature that's been standard in the genre for years. That doesn't detract from the beauty of this reveal though, as the sickly sunlight of that great tree looms into view. 
This might be from Software's most verdantly alive setting so far. They love stories about existentially broken and rotting worlds, so I wonder if this is an influence from George R. R. Martin. I thought at first that the lightning strikes in this area were to do with the NPC on the ledge in the background, but it might just be a random atmospheric event. After all, Elden Ring is borrowing fairly heavily from Breath of the Wild. Note that it leaves something behind on the ground. It looks like the same icon as the Sites of Grace, but I suspect it might just be a crafting component. I still suspect that there will be some kind of thematic, mystical connection between the golden light of the sky, the trees, lightning, and the Sites of Grace. It looked like the previous carriage was neutral, whereas the guards of this one are already hostile to us. I'm hoping this indicates that there might be some kind of factional system in the world. However, it might relate to From Software's Covenant system. This UI is likely a placeholder, but it does at least give us a chance to look at the stats. It looks like the XP will be called runes, and then we have a variety of other statistics. It looks like mind and intelligence are different things, which will come as a shock to those of us who are galaxy-brained. Note that they finally added a listing for how your equipment burden is actually affecting you too. A crafting system might be an interesting addition to the Souls formula, but I do kind of resent that it seems to be mandatory in all games now. There have been plenty of great open world RPGs that haven't needed it, and it can actually be detrimental to a design. It's clear that they've expanded on the stealth mechanics, which makes sense because they've been trying to make a stealth system work for about 10 years now, but I am curious as to how these sleep arrows work. I want to know if they'll enable non-lethal playstyles, but my suspicion is that it's effectively just a stun that only works if your opponent is unaware and possibly does not alert others. Apparently the poise system has been slightly expanded, so I wonder if some of the combat will play a little bit more like Sekiro, which would be a welcome addition in my opinion. Also, it seems like some special attacks are detachable and can be applied to different weapons, which will be a really interesting loot mechanic, I think. Letting you mix and match the item movesets that you like with the special attacks that you like. I think that'll be really fun to experiment with. I really hope that these loot coaches are a mixture of randomised wandering opportunities and handcrafted events, but if I get to the end of the game and not one of these has had a mimic in the back, I will be very disappointed. Spirit Summoning seems like it will be as developed a system as the miracles or sorceries of previous Souls games, but I've noticed some spirits seem to behave as NPCs, whereas others seem to be canned attack animations. Regardless, it looks like they finally solved the long-standing problem with their engine that prevented them from loading NPCs on the fly. Mechanics like this were impossible previously, because all NPCs had to be present in the area when it was first loaded, with summonable NPCs simply being stored underneath the game world ready to be deployed on demand. A silent NPC sitting by a bonfire does seem awfully familiar, but note that there is a Sight of Grace here as well. I wonder if NPCs lurking by respawn points is going to be particularly common. I think it'd be interesting if they each had their own places rather than the sort of gather everyone up and store them away in your personal NPC portfolio that previous games have had. Hey! But I'm glad to see that the Souls style multiplayer is being used for this. Obviously multiplayer wouldn't have worked in Sekiro, but I do find myself missing it whenever FromSoft make a game that slips away from the Dark Souls paradigm. It seems like stealth will be a core part of this game, and presumably very useful for avoiding monsters you can't handle yet. Something else I've noticed though is that the player seems to be using double weapons or two-handed weapons against human-scale targets and switching to a shield and weapon for large bosses. I wonder if this ties into the changes to the boys' mechanics that it might now be easier to overwhelm a human scale target, but more important to defend yourself against something bigger. There's something really weird about this boss's horse. It probably is just a weird horse, but the idea of hobbling a dragon, amputating its wings and forcing it to be a beast of burden is kind of horrifying. And it would definitely tie into some of the themes that it seems like this game is going to go for, especially if this guy is related to the boss that shows up at the end of this video. I still can't get over how gorgeous the environments in this look. It's clearly going to be its own thing, but it's also wearing its references on its sleeve. There's a little bit of Elder Scrolls, a lot of Breath of the Wild, there's even some Dragon's Dogma, and actually it most strongly reminds me of Dragon's Dogma, which is weird, because nobody played that.
player's horse, and I am going to keep calling it a horse even though it looks a lot more goat-like, seems to be effectively a part of your model and not a separate NPC. So it's going to lose a little bit of mechanical depth with regards to, for example, trying to prevent your horse from dying in battle. I cannot overstate how excited I am to start exploring these areas, I'm really looking forward to it. The sense of exploration has always been my favourite part of a FromSoft game, and it looks like that's a major component of the core experience here. There's just a lot of really interestingly visually designed, really vertical, weird places to go. It's nice to see the classic FromSoft animations, the big slow door opening, the skeleton patting himself on the head come back, but I do find myself worrying that these dungeons won't be unique. I hope that they're individually handcrafted, but it wouldn't surprise me if they took a page out of Bethesda's book and simply cut and pasted and remixed dungeons to massively bulk out the number of dungeons available. Obviously, designers have to make sacrifices and concessions when designing a huge open world, but FromSoft has always had that really important attention to detail. It's a major part of what makes their games so special. Place your bets now. Will there be hundreds of YouTube lore essays talking about how this chest being identical to the ones in Dark Souls proves that this game takes place in the same continuity? Or will there be hundreds of YouTube essays about how reuse of assets is an absolute sin and must never be tolerated? My money's on both. Greetings, traveller from beyond the fog. I am Melina. You can tell she's important because her scars are stylish. I offer you an accord. She mentions an accord. Presumably this is related to this game's equivalent to the Covenants system, but I think it would be really interesting if you could in some way pledge yourself to different NPCs, and maybe this would tie into the factional system that I hope the game has. Stormvale Castle being veiled in storms isn't quite as bad as Lordran being the land of ancient lords, but it's nice to see that their naming conventions are still in effect. Fantasy games love to have rural British accents. You, you're, you're tarnished, aren't you? I would advise against taking the main gate into the castle. It's tightly guarded by hardened old hands. Oh, tr tr try the opening right here. The guards don't know about it. You'll breach the castle undetected. Fair enough. You certainly don't have to trust me. Well, if you must go through the gates, I'll signal them to open. But of course, I'd advise against it. But note this guy's chest piece. I think it's a book, but it looks a lot like traditional manacles or handcuffs. It also features tree iconography, similar to that on Alexander's pot seal, a holy book that binds. Maybe it's connected to why this guy helps you, unlike all of the other NPCs in this area who seem to be hostile. My hope for the structure of the game world is that instead of the semi-linear systems they've used previously, there will be several different hubs, any of which can be approached in any given order. Note that these summons appear to just be attack animations rather than actually summoned NPCs. Also, note how the enemies here seem to be using wind-based attacks identical to those used by the player earlier. 
The sections showed in this video seem to be arbitrary sections, not sections of a single playthrough with a linear sequence of events. So this would lend weight to my hopes that you can approach the areas in any order and gain different abilities in them to mix and match as you please. Oh hey, they finally added a proper jump. Ooh, that's a nice piece of classic from soft sadism. I'm glad to see that some of the hard edges will still be there, which also reassures me that there might be mimics somewhere. There had better be one in one of those caravans at some point, or FromSoft will have lost their touch. I need that delicious cruelty to be alive. C can a person be said to have a dom-sub relationship with a corporation? Uh, anyway. The guy I pointed to in that hall area is a boss we meet outdoors later, so I'm hoping that the bosses can be taken perhaps in different arenas. Maybe there will even be optional ways to lure them out into more suitable places to fight them. The narrator mentions that dungeons are multi-layered and complex and can be approached from many angles, which I hope means that they're very carefully woven into the open world around them. You might even find yourself in one by accident simply by exploring other areas. I'm going to talk over this NPC because I want to talk about the room he's in, but Rogier here says the place is full of tarnish, which is apparently the kind of entity the player is. It wouldn't be FromSoft if you weren't some kind of weird, specific kind of person in their world. Undead, ashen, cursed, tarnished. Gotta play around with those evocative nouns. Anyway, he mentions tarnished hunters, they sacrifice our kind for grafting. The statue implies a religious connection to tree growth. Perhaps that's why the inhabitants of this area are stretched and long-necked. Maybe they are corrupted by their obsession, growing like trees over the eons. Grafting can refer to human medical practices, but one can graft trees together too. It's also the same tree growth iconography as we see with Alexander's pot, the holy book NPC earlier, and of course just the divine trees themselves in the sky. Shout out to COD of the Year 2022. Nice to see one of the most historically revisioned elements of medieval costuming getting a little representation for once. I haven't seen much of the G.R.R. Martin influence so far, to be honest. It all seems pretty classically Miyazaki. Godric the Golden. Ah, there it is. Mighty dragon. Thou'rt a true born heir. Lend me thy strength, O kindred. Deliver me unto greater heights. Notice that he has six fingers, and he does imply that he is related in some way directly well, to dragons, but the statue is spiked. It's a hunted dragon. It's not surprising that they've chosen this boss to finish off the presentation. The animation burden on him must have been huge, with all of those independently wiggling little fingies smoothly gesticulating away. He also calls himself the Lord of All That Is Golden. FromSoft have always played with the idea that it's our obsessions that corrupt us. In Souls, the associations of dragons have always been those of immortality, distance, the inviolable. But in European cultural connotations, they are inseparably tied to the idea of avarice, sleeping on a vast hoard that they can in no way use. Has this man, in wanting to become like dragons, found himself consumed with avarice? Or has this man, consumed with avarice, found himself becoming dragon-like? Everything else aside, it's time for my hottest take and biggest prediction. FromSoft love to have a bad lord or lords commit some kind of cosmic sin, the stain of which brings about the slow death of the world. But I suspect this time around, it's a cabal, with the Elden Ring referring not to an item or a place, but to a circle of conspirators. I would guess each zone has a member of the ring as its boss, but I think the zones can be tackled in any order, or at least in a more variable order than a Souls game. Some open world games are just open structures for a sequence of game experiences, whereas others try to have a sense of a living, breathing place. I think this will feel more like the former, but FromSoft games usually take place in liminal dream spaces, so that's not actually a criticism as it would be if I were talking about the way most other studios work. 
it's what they do and it really works for them. And my final thoughts are just that I am very excited to play this game. I suspect that I will lose myself to it in a way that I have not lost myself to a game in quite a while. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, check out the links in the description, all of that stuff. And I hope you'll join me for more videos soon.